Yeah, so this discussion group uh, was covering two topics, um, continuous trajectories and, and related to that lineage tracing, but it's also uh, quite different. So just to get everybody on the same page, uh, remind you what we mean by trajectories or continuous trajectories. So you saw this graph before, so this might be a, a, an RNA-seq, uh, single cell RNA-seq experiment. I'm just showing you two genes here, A and B. And if you plot it like this, what you obviously see is uh, some structure there. You see clear three blobs of points, and you might call this cluster one, two, and three, or you might even give it a name like erythrocyte or a neutrophil. What the, the trajectories are about is not so much assigning the clusters, that was what was uh, covered by, um, uh, by Dominique. The trajectories are the, the, the roads, the highways in between the clusters. So for example, cluster one and two might be connected. So some cells might somewhere in time traverse from one to two or from two to one. So what we want to do is, is something very interesting. We, we have data which is completely static because we killed all these cells and we have a snapshot. We never know, knew what these cells were doing. But what we want to do is we want to infer what they would have done if they would be alive. So th that's, we have to keep that in, in mind because that, of course, is something that you never can do. But this is something that physicists do all the time. They do this, and they call this ergodic theory. You say, well, th it's basically the same thing. And looking at one cell over time in, in great detail is basically the same, you know, if you met all the assumptions, to look at many, many cells at one time point. So th this, of course, is really, really nice because now you can get temporal information on data which is completely static. So that's, that's why we're so much interested in, in, in doing this. So the first uh, discussion item was very logical. It was, what is a trajectory? Let's first define it. And there was actually lots of discussion about how do you do that, because uh, there is really no clear uh, definition in the textbooks, at least not in the context of, of single-cell omics. So a so few things that were said. Well, you have two points, at least, A and B, and you traverse from A to B or B to A, and, and in the aesthetic data, of course, you can never distinguish going from A to B or B to A. There's no information about it, at least in the, in the standard data. So it's just a kind of a, a road between two points where you have a lot of cells in the high-dimensional transcriptome space, something from A to B. Uh, of course, then the question immediately comes up, you know, is there not an immediate, how many intermediate states are in between A and B, but that's more of a clustering problem, I guess, which was covered by Dominic already. Is there a unique, unique trajectory, or are there, you know, infinite many ones? Uh, and how do you sh are you sure that if the two trajectories that they're the same or different? You know, we, we need some error bars on these kind of paths so that you can say something about uh, uniqueness. So after some discussions, I think what we came up with, but please correct me if I'm wrong, is that we thought it, this is probably a probability distribution, right? So, and again, this is very simple. I just do this in one dimension now, but it's a probability that depends on Z and T, T being time, Z will be the transcriptome. I'm just showing you one dimensional uh, projection. And suppose the cell at T equals zero is all the cells are in A. So there will be a probability distribution with a delta function, you know, at position X equals zero or Z equals zero. And then over time they leak to the other side. Some cells might immediately traverse you know, in the first second to B. Other ones will take two hours. But this probability distribution will capture that all. Of course, you know, it's not all that simple, but this, this would be probably the more general way to think about a trajectory, so to really think about it as a probability distribution. And of course, the challenge is it's not in one dimension. This is going to be in 6,000 dimensions. So that makes it challenging. But this would probably be the, you know, the closest that I can come up with a prop as a proper definition. And again, this, this also then immediately gives you a very natural way to define error bars. So if you have probability distributions that overlap, you can come up with p-values and, and all these things. So you can get to the statistical significance. So this, this I'm going to think now about trajectories in this type of kind of definition, rather than being, you know, highways from A to B where, you know, cars are going left and right. That's, that's not the way you think about it in, in, this, in this world. So the other item which was very uh, lively discussed, I think, was the major kind of topic is, is how do you validate all these beautiful algorithms, you know, Monaco, Wanderlust, you know, STEM ID, how, how do you, are you sure that they're at all reflective of what's happening biologically? Are there any gold standards? And, and we had a lot of positive controls, and I actually forgot my slide on the negative control, which is probably the most more, more interesting one, which I will come back to. But so on positive controls, there are a lot of experimental systems where you, there is temporal information built in. For example, in embryogenesis, you know, the, the biologists would label it E6.5, E7.5, those embryonic days. 
that one day apart, if you pull the data set, you know that you know, a part of the data was generated 6.5 days after fertilization and the other one 7.5. So we actually have temporal data in there. You can use it at least to partly validate some of the predictions of your trajectories. Stem cells, if you know the stem cell, you know that if the stem cell is known, I have to say, then you know that differentiated cells will come from that point A. So you can label the stem cell as point A, the B will be the different differentiated cells, so you know that how they should be connected. So in a sense, the topology of the, of, the, of the interactions of the highways are known. Can you actually validate this with, with your algorithms? Uh, there's, uh, there's some methods to actually identify sister cells, so you know with, from other methods, methylation, for example, they're completely independent measurements that two cells are sisters. Is that actually making sense in, in terms of the transcript, though? A caveat here is, of course, that it doesn't have to make sense because uh, there might be a completely asymmetric division where these cells have completely different transcription states. They might be sisters, but they might be very different. And in other cases, there might be a symmetric division where the two cells are very similar, and then these trajectories make a lot of sense based on the transcript. Though. I think what, what we all agreed on is that we need other ways to validate you know, temporal information. And, and of course, the transcriptome is the easiest because we already have it. We can analyze it, but it's really not directly telling us what happened in time. You really would like to have other things which are much more directly reflective of the, of the lineage. And, and for example, uh, recently very nice papers came out like Memoir and, and Gestalt. Uh, we have been pushing a scar, scar trace where you put genetic marks into the genome at a certain point in time. For example, in development, you would label thousand cells early in development, and then you let the organism evolve to adult stage, and now you know at least what the clonal origin is of all these cells. So that's, of course, ideally what you want to do. And you know, these, these, these are great, but they're very difficult to implement in a human uh, system. So you have to think about how you would do it for a human uh, system. And then what we came up with is uh, probably what you, what you can do is you can look at variable nucleotides, you know, SNVs, for example. This is challenging, but it's uh, probably, you know, if we think very hard with everybody, we probably can, can, can come up with methods that are economic and, and, and scalable, because of course there are not that many uh, SNPs that you, or SNVs that you accumulate, right? There's only one per genome, per cell division, so it's an enormous he you know, needle in a haystack problem, but that would be the ideal, because that would be a, you know, an endogenous readout of the lineage. It also happens every cell division, which is also great. These methods typically, uh, they, you know, where you induce these kind of genetic changes, they're only during some time of development. You really want to do this every cell division, but you have to find these mutations, which is going to be a major challenge, but that would be ideal. And of course, it would be really great if you can read it out by RNA sequencing. Because if it had, you know, but that's, again, a great challenge because the RNA is only 1% of the genome. Of course, some systems you're, you're lucky, like T cells and B cells, they have T cell receptor, B cell receptor, they have re rearrangement of the genes, they have a built-in barcode for, for genetic uh, in, uh, ancestry, so that's great. Uh, as I said, uh, somatic mutations is probably the nicest. There are other, other ways to look at instability of mic microsatellites. Um, methylation, we didn't talk about too much. Uh, Amos was talking about it very nicely earlier on might be another way to do it. Uh, methylation is actually probably much easier to access than the, than the mutations, uh, but there, of course, it's not such a clean uh, link between you know, ancestry and the methylation state. Uh, it's much, much more clean for the, for the nucleotide variant. Another thing you can do, but this is also very limited, uh, it works probably only for the model organisms like C. elegans and, and zebrafish, there are basically movies out there that, you know, that basically have a time lapse from the one cell stage you know, to the 5,000 cell stage, so you know by, by microscopy what are the lineage what's the lineage information, you can compare it to the prediction of your models. But this, of course, uh, in humans will be difficult, although this morning we saw a beautiful talk on organoids, so at least six, you know, six day period, in a human uh, colon organoid, you can, you can do it. And another thing which, which you shouldn't forget about is there's already a lot of knowledge out there that people know, you know how cell types are generated. For example, in epidermis or in neutrophil development, people know there are six subtypes, you know, the early ones and the mature ones, so you can use this also to test drive your, your software on uh, trajectories. Now, I forgot the slide on the negative control, uh, which is actually probably the one which is you know, the hardest to think about, what, what does it mean to have a negative control? But it, I think there should be a negative control because it should be a, a system of cells that you 
put into your system, and you don't want any two directories to come out. You know, so there should, that should exist. Uh, so we were thinking about perhaps a homogeneous pool of stem cells, adult stem cells, or a homogeneous pool of fully differentiated cells that don't divide anymore. They should just be one state, no highways, no transitions. Algorithm should tell you there's no trajectories it can find. So that's, but that was um, actually much more difficult to, to come up with. And the last part we, th we thought about is why care? Why do you care about all this heavy-duty computation on trajectories? Well, the idea is that you know, the clusters, of course, are important, but if you know how to go from one to the other, uh, you have you know, at least candidates or a hint of how the molecular machinery is working, you know, how it would it switch on a certain pathway to go from A to B. Right? It, it's basically trying, to, again, to put in the temporal information, and that helps you to decipher the molecular logic. Uh, ideally, this will give you a causal you know, reason. Causality, will, would, would, would you can get out of this. You say, okay, if this goes up, then the cell goes from A to B, and this is how you learn how, how the biology works. Um, and this, of course, will allow you to identify new cell types. You know, for example, a novel stem cell in adult tissue, you, know, you find some, some cell in your, in your uh, trajectory analysis where all the trajectories will com come back to one cell. Well, this might be the stem cell. And again, if you're lucky, it's, it's a new cell type. Uh, so this will be very, very interesting. Now, and the last but not least, it, it's a beautiful uh, field where you know, mathematicians and computer scientists get really interested in because it's really beautiful science. And we shouldn't forget about it, it's because otherwise there probably wouldn't be so many computational biologists here. It would be really boring. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, we're very happy that uh, it's a very interesting uh, science and at the same time extremely useful for the biological community. So that's basically it, and thank you very much. Questions? <coughs> Over here, a question? Just, just, yeah, just, uh, can you just wait for the microphone? Sorry. So this is very nice. So uh, regard, I have a technical question regarding the, uh, uh, how do you infer the probability distribution to go from one state to another one. Uh, so are there any discussion about on which basis such uh, uh, probabilities should be uh, uh, inferred? Is that only based on the uh, gene expression similarity or if there's other information we can use for that purpose? Well, this is very, very much, you know, conceptual. So we definitely didn't think we didn't have the time to really nail it down. But of course, in a sense, what it is, it's, it's a cloud of points in a high-dimensional space, and you basically you're you're going to bin that in in, in high-dimensional bins and come up with a, you know, a relative fractions, which would be proportional to probability. Now, um, so that's act more an experimental definition. So the the the, the, the mathematics uh, we didn't really cover in enough detail to nail it down. But I would say it's it's, it's, it's in a sense. Uh, rather than thinking about you know going s straight from A to B, you know you have a probability to be somewhere in between A and B at a certain time, and it's going to be you know you're going to throw a coin to determine if you'll be there or not. So it, it's, it's just a more probabilistic way of thinking about it. You know the exact mathematics we didn't discuss. Okay. Up there. Yep. Uh, in your last slide, you talk about the ideal case being um, showing causality yeah. uh, between certain markers that you would find presumably in the, in the highways and the fact that the cell is transitioning. Yeah. Um, how, in the ideal case, how would you distinguish between a causal marker and a passenger marker to, take, to, to, steal, from, to steal from the, the cancer uh, nomenclature? I mean, to really nail down the causality, you probably have to do a dedicated experiment where you would then, you know, take take the prediction from 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 the trajectories. And you say, well, it seems that protein A is degrading protein B. Th and then you ha go in the lab and actually, you know, transiently express A and see what happens to B. I think it, um, in the end, uh, well, that's probably what I would do. But you might take a shortcut. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm 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 lazy. And <laughs> I'd like to, even though most of this uh, meeting is focused around single cell RNA seq, where most of uh, the data is, uh, I think that when we add the epigenetic layer and see how the epigenetic uh, layer and uh, the open regions uh, change along the trajectory, that actually might give us a window 
into uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. So let's not forget that there is an epigenetic layer planned and, and regulation is clearly one of its advantages. Yeah, that will help too. Yeah. Dominic? Uh, so, so clustering and uh, trajectory inference, they have kind of complementary goals. So with clustering, you would like to partition the data. With trajectory inference, you want to kind, kind of find uh, the continuum between different groups. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that should be done independently or do you think that in some way clustering should inform trajectory inference or vice versa? Yeah, as you know, there are different ways to do it. You know, so we, we basically did the clustering and then put highways in between. I think that's one way to do it. Uh, there, there's no one answer to the, to the question, I think. Uh, you probably know better. Uh, but you know, in case there are very clear clusters, you know, it, it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't feel bad to first cluster and then uh, try yeah, to figure out what it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think it really matters on the type of uh, system. So I think that one of the most important things that we have to understand here, uh, dealing with these very different biological systems with very different uh, uh, features is that there's not going to be one answer or one algorithm that's going to fit each biological domain. I think they are, as you said, complementary and different combinations of these in different ways are going to be uh, better suited for different systems and different biological questions. That's why this is called the analysis garden rather than the analysis dictatorship. <laughs> okay. Other questions about the analysis garden, not dictatorship? Maybe up there first, and then Fabian afterwards. First. Uh, yeah, so uh, kind of maybe in line with this idea of, you know, is there, isn't there a trajectory? Did you guys discuss, um, you know, some way of maybe proving to yourself or feeling comfortable about saying that there is or isn't a trajectory in, in some kind of way that's unbiased and doesn't require you know, knowing a priori the biological system. I think that's the whole idea of the gold standard data set. So right now everything we're doing in this pseudo time analysis and it's pseudo time because we're making very strong assumptions. So right now, barring anything else, we're just making strong biologically motivated, not completely insane assumptions, but they are assumptions and uh, like every assumption, they often could be proved wrong. That's the importance of the gold standard data sets. I think having gold standard data sets as we're working on this to compare to where we do have an answer, where we do have uh, a clear uh, ex experimental evidence for a trajectory is gonna be critical. We can then uh, look for other features um, and see what type of signatures and footprints uh, we see that really indicate trajectories and do they match our assumptions. So I think once we have our answers on, on, on systems where we do know the answer, we can try and use these to learn on what we might be able to say where, where this is not given to us. Fabian. I, I just wanted to add to, to this uh, two previous question, a, a question that came up during the discussion. Actually, Dana, you asked this was, uh, Dana drew two dots and then had sort of what happens if there's a hole in between. Do we know if there's a trajectory or not? And I think one of the discussion points that came up was, uh, was that this obviously depends on the sampling density, so you could look somewhere else and uh, try to see uh, if you would have connected them in some other region, if you had, let's say, downsampled that or something like that. But I think the, the main point uh, I'd like to advocate here is that although these sound like two different problems, I think they can be asked within the, a single framework. So for example, if you make a k-nearest neighbor graph that's very common to many methods, then if things are very far apart, they would actually naturally decompose themselves into disjoint groups. So I think in the end, this would be cool to have a single framework to answer both of these. Can you pass the microphone? So uh, trajectory intuitively, to me at least, is developmental trajectory. Another, perhaps related, is a state. So uh, I wonder whether there was a discussion about how these two might be related, whether the uh, developmental trajectory is a larger distance, but the state uh, is a sort of more shorter variation of, let's say, you also mentioned about error bar, whether the error bar could be uh, considered uh, 
sort of state superimposed on, um, upon a trajectory, for example, and those are sort of uh, some inherently related uh, biological issues. Well, it might, it might be that <clears throat> the state is just a period of the trajectory where you slow down. That's, I guess, that's how I think about it, is that, you know, if, for example, if there are a couple of states, developmental states, you know, you would move from, you know, one state to another one, and then you would stay there some time, and then you move on again. So I think it could be part of the trajectory. Uh, I think the semantics has been kind of flavored over, you know, during history as something where you, you stay uh, more longer than normal, right? But you can also think about a cell cycle state, you know, the M phase is actually not that long. Uh, so you stay there and then you go into S phase, but I think it's just more semantics. I, I would say it's all part of the trajectory, but you slow down there normally than when you transition from, you know, A to B. But, but I, was, I was thinking that even when you reach the mature end point, that's a yeah. physiological or so. You can stop there. Yeah, that's fine. Ter there, there are termini uh, all over the place where you're just stuck and you never get out. Uh, that's fine too. Yeah, so there's we, also... We, dis we discussed that there are actually multiple trajectories going on. Uh, the developmental maturity trajectory, the, the cell cycle, which is sometimes confounded, particularly in immune cells, and sometimes uh, are not, as well as, as you said, some metabolic trajectories. So each transition from one state to another um, is a trajectory, and sometimes a cell is undergoing a number of uh, not completely linked uh, trajectories, and you might want to de decompose these in your analysis. Cell death would be, you know, an obvious yeah. end, end point, right? So they would go there and then they would disappear and there, there would be no branching anymore. That could happen. Okay, so let's thank Dana and Alexandra again.